Good evening, everybody. My name is John Gallen, and I'm the director of the Clinical Center and a co-organizer of this course, along with uh, Fred Ognebeni, who is on leave and won't be at the NIH today. And on behalf of the entire faculty of the NIH who will participate in this course and faculty from outside the NIH, welcome. We hope this course proves to be an exciting opportunity for all of you. And in a moment, I'll tell you how many folks are taking this course uh, in addition to the folks who are assembled here at the NIH Clinical Center. So I'm going to start off by <laughs> giving you some uh, review of the course, and then I will go into the topic of the first talk on the history of clinical research. So this is an exciting year. This is our 20th anniversary of this course. It started in 1995 in a small classroom here in this building when we had about 15 students taking the course. And it's grown in, uh, actually it was 25 students. Uh, now uh, we have about 4,800, or actually I was told by today's registrants, over 5,000 students taking the course right now. So it's a little modest growth over these 20 years. And uh, we use long distance learning techniques to reach 102 off-site centers worldwide. And um, more than 80% of our students are off-site, or close to 4,000. Now, I'll give you a few more pieces of data. Uh, of the off-site locations, 58 are in the United States, and 30 of them are new this year. And internationally, there are 45 sites, and 24 of them are new. So to all the folks off-site, we welcome you, and you'll hear in a moment how you can interact with the faculty. So the textbook for this course is titled Principles and Practice of Clinical Research, which is now in the third edition. And you can get this online or at the NIH FAS bookstore. In, uh, there's a new location here at the NIH in Building 10, first floor near the Mazur Auditorium. Handouts uh, for each talk will be posted on the course website, which is shown on this slide. And we ask you to please fill out evaluations of each lecture, um, which will appear on the course website following the lecture. We use this to uh, give feedback to the speakers, and we also use this to decide who gets to speak next year and who doesn't. So we really appreciate you taking a little bit of time to uh, give us some feedback. There's also a video archive of each uh, talk, and uh, these will be posted within 48 hours following the presentation. Any questions that you have related to a talk can be submitted to the course coordinator, Mr. Daniel McNally. Uh, at the website indicated here, and he will see that all questions are funneled to the person who gives the uh, lecture, and then you'll get a response. At the end of the course, uh, there's an exam, and uh, the examination will be posted on the course website, so you can take it as an open book exam. Uh, certificates will be granted to anyone who gets a grade of 75 percent or higher uh, when taking this uh, test. So if you have any questions about the course, you can call the number at the bottom, 301-496-9425, uh, and your questions will be answered. So this discussion board feature is on the web. and. This provides an opportunity to interact uh, on the, um, uh, through the web, and uh, this is how the, the site that you can reach um, 
I guess the website is what I showed you a few minutes ago. So let me go through the outline for the course. There's a series of modules. The first one is called Study Design, Measurement, and Statistics, and includes all the uh, uh, talks bulleted on this slide. I will not read each one of them. You can look into the uh, handouts of the course outline, uh, but you can see this includes the uh, introduction to statistical design and statistical methods, which is uh, so important in the business of clinical research. The second module, ethical, legal, monitoring, and regulatory considerations, uh, addresses legal issues in clinical research, ethical principles, data and safety, monitoring committees, the institutional review boards, and there's a, a session with a mock IRB, which has always been very popular, and then a talk on research with vulnerable participants. The third module, Preparing and Implementing Clinical Studies, uh, has a series of um, talks uh, focusing on developing protocols and manuals, um, evaluation of the budget, things like scientific conduct, FDA product regulation, um, and uh, other regulatory um, requirements. The fourth module is addition study, additional study designs and miscellaneous topics and uh, ranges from tech transfer to uh, dissemination and implementation of research, uh, health disparities research, and how to deal with the media. So we have a wonderful uh, student body who are taking this course literally throughout the world, and um, we look forward to your feedback and hope that this is, proves to be useful. So the topic that I'm going to cover is an overview of the history of this business, which is, after all, risky business for the patients, as well as big business uh, for the pharmaceutical industry and the biotechnology industry. But we can learn a lot from going back to the beginning and seeing uh, some of the things that happened. So I will try to give you a survey. Uh, it's sort of a hobby of mine, and I enjoy it. And I want to just say right out front at the beginning that it's impossible to cover everything and to recognize everyone. And if I omitted your favorite historical feature, you can tell me, and next time I'll try to include it. But I apologize, but there's literally thousands and thousands of superstars that make this um, a wonderful uh, story. So let me start with the definition of clinical research. And this is not a historical definition, but it sets a perspective for the course. This was produced at NIH in 1996 in a special panel that met here and divided clinical three research into three broad categories. Patient-oriented research, epidemiologic and behavioral studies, and outcomes research and health services research. So patient-oriented research, which is the one we most frequently think about if we're doing clinical research, is research conducted with human subjects or material of human origin, such as tissues, specimens, and cognitive phenomena for which an investigator or a colleague directly interacts with human subjects and includes the development of new technologies, mechanisms of human disease, therapeutic interventions, and clinical trials. So these three categories, patient-oriented research, epidemiologic and behavioral studies, and outcomes research, and health services research, is what you're going to be thinking about during this course. So I love this quote, which comes from Isaac Newton, who in 1676 wrote, if I have seen a little further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And that's applicable to anyone who's succeeded in doing clinical research over the many millennium. 
It's hard to know when clinical research started, but in 2850 BC, Imhotep, who was a known scribe, a chief lector, and a priest, an architect, an astronomer, and a magician, and at those days, medicine and magic were used together, he diagnosed and treated over 200 diseases, performed surgery, and practiced some dentistry. And he extracted medicine from plants and knew the position and function of the vital organs and circulation in the blood system. So this was 2850 BC. The Chinese, here we are 2737 BC, according to the um, source that I had, were also exploring uh, medicine. Emperor Sheng Nung experimented with poisons and classified medical plants. He's reputed to have eaten 365 medicinal plants over the course of his life. Supposedly, he turned green and died. Now, I'm going to go through some examples as I go through this talk. Uh, and some of them I will go from the ancient to the present just to give you a perspective. And one of them is malaria, which is an ancient disease, first described in China in ancient medical writings. In 2700 BC, several characteristic symptoms of malaria were described in the Nixing. And a plant called King Quing Hao or Artemisia annua was described in some medical treatises. Um, and 52 remedies were advocated as found in the Mawangdu tomb. In 340 AD, the anti-fever pr uh, properties of this plant, King Hao, was first described by Ji Han in the East Yin dynasty. And the active ingredient known as artemisinin was recently isolated by a Chinese scientist, Professor Tu Yuyu, in 1971. And I had a chance to meet Dr. Yuyu because she received the Lasker Award in clinical research in New York the same year that the Clinical Center received the Lasker Award in public service. And she said that what she did was she was asked apparently by Mao earlier, to find uh, some medicines for malaria because the Chinese army needed these uh, in where they were going. And she went to this old literature and found that this Artemisia plant uh, was reported to be uh, helpful. And she went back to the original readings and with her colleagues, the biochemical structure, which is shown here, was identified and she developed this new drug, which has literally, literally saved millions of lives throughout the world. And just this month, she received the Nobel Prize um, for this work, the first Chinese investigator to ever receive a Nobel Prize. I'm also going to tell you about uh, some of the areas of medicine. And we'll, we'll spend a few minutes on surgery. Um, Ruta is the father of Indian surgery, and many would say was perhaps the father of surgery. He lived about 600 BC, although this is not completely clear, and uh, lived with the uh, era of the Gupta kings. He wrote medical texts about surgery, and his most famous, Shushruta Samhita, is literally an encyclopedia of medical learning from his day. He counted the bones in the body, and he came up with 300. Does anybody in the audience know how many bones people think are in the human body today, or know they're in the human body today? No respondents, so I'll, I'll make it easy. It's, it depends on when you take the measurement. At birth, it said there's about 300 bones, and then the bones fuse, so that in the adult is probably about 206 bones. So he was remarkably accurate. Um, remember, this is 600 BC. He also realized the importance of keeping wounds clean. He did not use the word sterilization, but he talked about clean wounds. And he discussed options for instruments in surgery, 
and concluded that the hand was the best instrument available. So you can go to all sorts of places to uh, get insights into clinical research. And perhaps the earliest so-called trial, as I'll call it, uh, comes from the Bible, uh, the book of Daniel. And Daniel said, test your servants for 10 days and let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Now, us is a group of Jews who were captured by the Egyptians, and they didn't want to have to eat the non-kosher food. And so he was clever. And so to avoid that, he said, conduct this test. So give us vegetables to eat and water to drink and compare your servants uh, uh, who will get rich foods. So then let our appearance and the appearance of the youth who eats the king's rich food be observed by you, and according to what you see, deal with your servants. So we hearkened to them on this matter and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they, the ones who ate the vegetables and water, were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's rich foods. So the steward took away their rich food and the wine and gave them vegetables. So this is in the Bible. There's no informed consent. <laughs> But perhaps the greatest uh, mind in early medicine and clinical research was Hippocrates, who was born about 460 BC and died about 370 BC. And you all know about the Hippocratic method. And what Hippocrates advocated was observation. And he said, a great part of the art is to be able to observe. And he recorded a whole over a hundred descriptions of clinical situations. Let me read you one, his description of pulmonary edema. He said, water accumulates, the patient has fever and cough, the respiration is fast, the feet become edematous, the nails appear curved, and the patient suffers as if he has pus inside, only less severe and more protracted. One can recognize that it is not pus, but water, if you put your ear against the chest, you can hear it seize, seethe inside like sour wine. So this is incredible. And I've had a chance to read a bunch of his, his descriptions. And they're remarkable for how accurately he observed and described his patients. So he had some amazing accomplishments. He dissociated medicine from theology and philosophy. He really established the science of medicine, and of course, he provided physicians the highest moral inspiration that they have. Wound management is something he wrote about, and he said, if water was used for irrigation, it had to be very pure and boiled, and the hands and nails of the operator were to be cleansed. So this was long before anybody recognized infection, infectious diseases. And uh, this was from Hippocrates. So you're going to see that we're going to be going around the world and hearing about uh, investigators or uh, champions of clinical research from everywhere. And let's focus on Iranian medicine uh, for a moment. There were two individuals, Al Razi and Ibn Siba, Sina. So Razi lived about 865 to 925, and he discovered use of al alcohol and mercurial compounds as antiseptics. He made numerous contributions to medicine as well as alchemy and philosophy, but he actually wrote the first treatise on pediatrics, and this was recorded in over 184 books and articles. Now, Ibn Sina, or Ibn Sina, as he was called, lived from 973 to 1037 AD. And he was a leader in pharmacy, philosophy, medicine, and pharmacology. And he was the principal author of the Canon of Medicine, which was the main European medical textbook. It had been modified, obviously, over the centuries but it was active particularly from the 14th to the 16th century. 
And this book contains the first known treatise on clinical trials and provided the foundation for systematic approach to drug testing. And I just want to go over with you what was said back then uh, around 1000 AD. So the seven conditions for experimentation. First, if you want to experiment with something, it should be pure. Second, the drug must be tested for only one condition at a time. Third, drugs must be tested in contradictory disease states. Four, strength of a drug must be a proportionate to the severity of the disease. Fifth, time of therapeutic effect must be considered. Six, drugs must be observed for continued action. And seven, a drug must be tested in humans before judgment. So this is pretty amazing when you think of when these uh, uh, conditions were uh, defined. So now I'm going to be skipping a couple of centuries and we'll start talking about anatomy and to my thinking one of the, the greatest uh, early anatomists was Leonardo da Vinci. This is the only self-portrait of him that's known to be available. Um, he did this uh, near the end of his life. And if you go through his works and you look at his descriptions, uh, drawings of the human anatomy, it's really quite phenomenal. And here are a couple of pictures. The microscope was an important uh, addition to uh, medicine and clinical research. So let me tell you in a slide a little bit about the microscope. In the first century AD, glass was uh, tested by the Romans who recognized when thick in the middle and thin at the edges, you got magnification. Imen al Haytham, who lived in Egypt, was the father of optics. He was also a great astronomer. The 13th century eyeglasses were invented. The first eyeglasses were made in Germany in 1286. In 1590, Zacharias Janssen and his son, who were Dutch, invented the compound microscope with two lenses and a cylinder. And in 1609, Galileo added a focusing device. And that was the beginning of the microscope. But it was Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek who first used uh, a microscope um, in clinical research. He lived in the uh, 1600s to the 1700s, and he worked um, in a dry goods store, and he needed to count the number of threads in an inch or in a, in a certain amount of uh, space to judge the quality of the, um, the linens that uh, were being produced. And so he made special small lenses which could magnify up to 270 power. And in the bottom of the slide is uh, his first microscope. And I got a facsimile of that that I found in a small store in Maine of all places. And you can see this is the lens and you can put an object on it and you look through the other side and position your object with this, this screw. And using this, he described the first bacteria, yeast, sperm, striated muscle, crystalline lens of the eye, and red cells, among others. And you can imagine sitting there and looking at a light uh, and then making drawings of this. It's uh, really quite phenomenal. So having described red cells, uh, it makes me uh, want to bring to your attention William Harvey, who lived in England uh, from 1578 to 1657. And he was the one who really uh, defined the circulatory system uh, in, in great detail and accuracy. Uh, in the same uh, period, a little later, uh, Sir Christopher Wren, who you probably know for his architecture, um, he also invented the intravenous needle. Uh, it was made out of sterling silver. And he um, connected the bleeder, the, the needle to the um, 
uh, urethra uh, and um, infused dogs with opiates and was the first to describe the effects of um, intravenous opiates in a, in a mammal. He also gave the needle to a friend of his, uh, who's shown on the bottom of this slide, Richard Lauer, who in 1667 did the first transfusion into man using sheep's blood, and the uh, man survived, probably because he only gave about 10 cc's of blood. And a few months earlier, John Baptiste Denny's in France um, gave about the same, or, or 12 ounces of sheep blood into a 15-year-old boy who survived. But the first use of man-to-man -man or man-to-woman or uh, transfusion was by James Blundell, who uh, in 1828 uh, uh, did a number of transfusions without any typing and cross-matching, and about half of uh, the 12 subjects he described survived. Uh, and he was able to show in this um, uh, etching, which appeared in Lancet in 1828, uh, that he could save a person who was exsanguinating after uh, a woman after a uterine uh, uh, operation that wasn't going well. He saved her life. Of course, the advent of blood types was not until 1900 when Carl Landsteiner, who was working at the Rockefeller University, defined the ABO and AB blood types, and that was the beginning of really the modern uh, transfusion medicine uh, uh, approaches that we have. Now, in terms of modern terminology uh, or thinking, maybe the first clinical trial was done by James Lind. Uh, and he worked in England in the 1700s. And at that time, scurvy was a major health problem in the British Navy. And William Harvey, who I had mentioned earlier, had recommended lemons to treat scurvy, but had argued that the therapeutic effect was the result of the acid in the fruit. And it was Lind, who was a naval surgeon, conducted a clinical trial in 1747 to assess the utility of three therapies on scurvy. So he took 12 sailors, sailors with classical scurvy, divided into six groups of two each, and all were given identical diets, and the various groups were supplemented with either vinegar, dilute sulfuric acid, cider, seawater, nutmeg, garlic, and horseradish mixture, or two oranges and one lemon daily. And here are the results of all his studies. The only thing that worked was citrix fruit, and it was not significant. But of course, they didn't have statistics in those days. So he wrote a paper, which is shown on this slide, and became famous because based on these data, um, scurvy was prevented in the Navy by giving people um, citrus fruit. So let me move on now to uh, smallpox. As you'll see as I go through the rest of this talk, I happen to have a profound interest in infectious diseases because that's my area uh, clinically and, uh, and immunology. So let's talk a little bit about smallpox, which has a pretty neat history. Smallpox was first uh, described by Al Razi, who I had mentioned earlier, uh, probably about 900 AD. In the 11th century, there actually were protective measures being used throughout the world taking scabs from smallpox pustules uh, and putting them in the nostrils of a healthy subject. And that actually offered some protection if you didn't get smallpox. People were wearing the clothing of someone who had the disease. People ingested powdered fleas from infected cows, which may have um, perceived the relationship of cowpox to smallpox. In the 1720s, the process of what's called virulation was practiced in Africa, China, and India, where you would take a scab from a patient who had smallpox, remove it from the subject, 
and take the contents of that scab and scratch it into a healthy uh, person. Most people got protected. Some people got smallpox. And Lady Mary Worley Montague, who was British and the wife of the British ambassador, observed in Turkey, in Constantinople, this virulation process, and she brought it to London, and she even inoculated her own two children. And uh, a hospital for smallpox inoculation was founded in London in 1745 using this approach. The first known use of um, cow pox to protect against smallpox was done by Benjamin Jesty, who lived in 1736 to 1816. And he was a farmer who lived in a village of Yetminster in northeast United, Dorset in the United Kingdom. And he was convinced that milkmaids who can't contracted cowpox were protected from smallpox. And in 1774, he inoculated himself, his wife, and two sons with cowpox lymph from the underside of a cow udder. And in 1805, he publicly inoculated uh, his son, Robert, with live smallpox after he had inoculated or immunized him. And he demonstrated that his son was protected. So this was before Jenner. But what Jenner did in 1776 was actually do a large study. And here you see him uh, vaccinating James Phillips, the, the first person who was vaccinated. And he did a large study, and he recorded the data and talked about it. And it was after Jenner's work uh, with smallpox that a vaccine that was efficacious was developed. Now, before we conclude smallpox, I just want to mention one historical uh, uh, fact. Uh, I don't want to dwell on Lord Jeffrey Amherst, who actually did the first biological warfare, taking blankets from people who were infected with smallpox and giving it to the Indians in the French-Indian War. It was pretty horrible. Uh, but George Washington did something remarkably clever. In 1775 and 1776, when the British were surrounding Boston and the Continental Army in the United States was um, threatened, the British Army had an epidemic of smallpox, which had not hit the Continental Army. And Washington made the decision that he wanted to do the virulation technique in the soldiers. But he wouldn't do it without the consent of the Continental Congress. And so he got John Adams, who on July 3rd, 1776, the day before the Declaration of Independence was signed, he got Adams to get the Continental Congress to give approval for mass immunization of the Continental Army. And this was, to my knowledge, the first example of mass immunization of, of in the military or probably anywhere else. Um, and it worked. It probably saved the Army and enabled the uh, United States to beat, or the Continental Army to beat the British eventually. And now, of course, smallpox has been eradicated through the work of D.A. Henderson. Um, and the uh, last case was in 1977. And the World Health Organization declared smallpox completely eradicated in 1980. So genetics, we all know about genetics. We know about Mendel, who was the father of genetics, working with plants. And uh, you may not know about Barbara McClintock, who lived from 1902 to 1992, um, and was a fabulous cytogeneticist and did groundbreaking research in developing the technique of visualizing maize or corn chromosomes and used microscopic analysis to generate many fundamental ideas and discovered transposition and used it to demonstrate that genes are responsible for turning physical characteristics on and off. And in 1983, she won the Nobel Prize for her discoveries of mobile genetic elements. 
and you know about Darwin, uh, who lived in, uh, in 1859, published his book on the origin of the species. Um, you may not know that he created the first tissue bank and demonstrated the importance of meticulous records. During his travels, he took tissues from all the different species that he studied, and he actually created a tissue bank. So clinical medicine depends on epidemiology for much of the work. And I want to just mention John Snow, who was an anesthesiologist who lived from 1813 to 1858, who was British. And he was a real medical hygiene pioneer and really the father of modern epidemiology for work tracing the source of a cholera epidemic in Soho, England in 1854. And he created this spot map in the city of um, uh, London and Soho to illustrate each case of cholera during this epidemic. And he demonstrated that it all centered around a water pump. And he illustrated the connection between the quality of water source and the cholera cases. And he said, remove the water pump and you'll get rid of the cholera, and they did. And then the community went ballistic because they had to walk long distances to get the water. So they reopened it, the cholera came back, so he really proved his point. Then they closed the pump and the epidemic subsided. So this was a major event in public health history. Maybe the greatest uh, public health invention in the 1800s was um, by Semmelweis, who I'll tell you about in a minute. But remember what I told you that Sushruta had advocated sterilization of wounds and Hippocrates promoted clean hands for wound management. But it was this man, Ignaz Semmelweis, who really uh, uh, solidified the importance of sanitation in medicine. And he lived from 1848 to 1863, a short life. He studied corporal sepsis in Vienna over the protests of his chief. He was an anesthesiologist. He had noted that the sepsis rate was three times higher in Division I in his hospital than in Division II, and these two divisions were identical except medical students worked in Division I and midwives in Division II. He had a dear friend who died following infection of an autopsy that his friend did. He was a pathologist. And it was um, autopsy in a patient who had a wound similar to purple sepsis. And this led him to the primary hypothesis that the infection that was seen in the women who were delivering babies came from the autopsy room by the medical students to these women who were giving birth. So he said the students had to wash their hands, and he used chlorinated lime solution, the space and still exists that he used. And when he did that, the mortality rate dropped from 18% to 1% per year, and in some months in 1848, it was zero. And these are the data that he published, and you can see by this yellow line, which is the number of women who had sepsis, uh, who uh, died. And the red arrow is when he started having them wash their hands and it immediately plummeted. So he told his chief about this and the chief didn't believe his data and he was fired. So then he moved to Budapest, Hungary where he repeated these experiments and got the same results and he wrote a paper, The Etiology, Understanding and Prevention of Purple Sepsis and it was rejected by the Vienna Medical Journey Journal, and ultimately he had to pay to get this work published, but it was published. And I can tell you, uh, he had a sad outcome. He, he went crazy because nobody believed him, and he was admitted to a mental hospital, and he cut his leg on the edge of a bed, and he died of purple sepsis. Now his work was um, um, known by uh, some folks in the United States, and uh, I'll tell you about that in a second. But in the interim, in 1882, uh, uh, Joseph Lister 
uh, also was working on uh, the importance of sepsis in the operating room, and he used carbolic sprays to clean wounds, uh, open wounds, and he showed that uh, this would reduce infection. Uh, so the, the person who advocated for Semmelweis was Oliver Wendell Holmes, Sr., the father of the great Supreme Court Justice in the United States, who was an obstetrician who worked at Massachusetts General Hospital. And he didn't repeat Semmelweis's experiments, but he believed them, and he went around and uh, spoke this up and, uh, and certainly got uh, clean hands uh, and washing hands is an integral part of uh, 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 the public health of uh, hospitals. Sadly, it's still a huge problem. And I can tell you in this hospital at the NIH Clinical Center, a few years ago, we had an epidemic of a multi-drug resistant Klebsiella infection, and it was clearly linked to people not washing their hands in an aggressive enough fashion. So. Something as simple as washing hands is phenomenally important. So let me tell you a little more about surgery, more modern surgery. I can't uh, uh, escape telling you about John Hunter, who lived from 1728 to 1793, who really changed the nature of surgery. He was a Scottish anatomist and a surgeon. Uh, his older brother was an established surgeon, and his mother didn't know what to do with him, so she sent him to work with his brother. And his brother, who was a surgeon, told him to go out and rob graves. And uh, he became, uh, they would take these corpses and teach anatomy uh, uh, to people who were interested. And he became quite the skilled uh, anatomist and then surgeon. And one of the things he did is determine the nature of venereal disease, and he actually inoculated him himself with an infected material from someone who had syphilis, and he got syphilis, and he eventually uh, had heart damage from the syphilis. There's a great book called The Knife Man, and if you're interested, I suggest you read it. It's, it's a very colorful book about his life. Anesthesia, uh, we, we can't uh, mention without uh, mentioning William T.G. Morton, who was a dentist who lived from 1890 to 1868. And he demonstrated that ether, which he called lithion, uh, uh, worked. And uh, he did a uh, demonstration in 1846, October 16, 1846, at Mass General Hospital in Boston, uh, demonstrating uh, that surgery can be conducted on a person while they're asleep with no pain. So. With that background, now let me bring you uh, some uh, stories about the pharmaceutical industry. And I would like to start that with uh, mentioning Claude Bernard, who was French and lived from 1813 to 1878. And among his accomplishments, he recognized the pancreas was important in digestion. He described the glycogenic function of the liver. He described the vasomotor system, the vasodilator and vasoconstrictor nerves, and he discovered curare and its application in medicine. Rudolf Virchow, who lived from 1821 to 1902, was Polish. He defined leukemia, and he wrote, ominous cellular a cellula, every cell originates from another cell. So he defined stem cells probably the first person. He also defined pulmonary emboli as related to thrombosis and embolism. And one of my heroes historically is Pasteur, who lived from 1822 to 1895. If you look carefully at this picture, you'll note that his right arm is sort of just hanging loose. And that was because at a young age he had a stroke and he couldn't use his right arm. And despite that, was able to make his phenomenal discoveries, uh, including the germ basis of fermentation, germ theory of infectious diseases. He discovered staphylococci as the cause of boils. He described streptococcus pyogenes as the cause of purple sepsis, the disease Semmelweis studied. 
He made the first vaccine for anthrax and, of course, the vaccine for rabies. Koch, who lived uh, in a similar era uh, from 1843 to 1910, uh, developed the Petri dish and the use of blood agar pore plates to culture bacteria. He was the first to describe anthrax infection before Pasteur made the vaccine. He described and cultured tuberculosis, the first person to do that, and he developed the TB skin test. He described waterborne epidemics. He made his Koch's postulates, and in 1905 was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work on tuberculosis. And if you look in his book, and I have a copy of his book, these are all hand drawings. Here he was, uh, drew the anthrax bacillus. Baring, who lived in Germany from 1854 to 1917, discovered antibodies, first person to describe them for diphtheria, and he was the first to use passive immunization to uh, 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 treat a person who uh, had been exposed and he won the Nobel Prize in 1901. Uh, Paul Ehrlich, who was Polish, described eosinophils as a medical student. He described the complement pathway and the humoral immunity system, but he also developed the first antibiotic, uh, in this case, to treat syphilis, and he worked with his technician, Sharachuro Hata, and uh, they developed what hoax called Salvarsin, which was an ars arsenobenzene, which had 32% arsenic and was toxic. And later, they developed a compound that was less toxic called compound 914. And Ehrlich said, we need magic bullets. We must search for magic bullets. We must strike the parasites and the parasites only, if possible. And to do this, we must learn to aim with chemical substances. So this was the first description of the need for antibiotics. And of course, Fleming, um, who uh, in 1928, while working on influenza virus, observed mold on a staff culture plate with a bacteria-free circle around it. Now, most people probably would have just thrown it out, but he asked why was there no bacteria around this mold, and he discovered penicillin and won the Nobel Prize in 1945. Insulin is an interesting story, and it gets to a little bit about scientific ethics. In the summer of 1928-21, uh, material extracted from the islets of Langerhans, called insulin from the Latin for island, was given to diabetic dogs. and. The result was that abnormally high blood sugar levels were lowered. Within six weeks, Banting and Best, Banting was a junior scientist and Best was a technician, they had purified insulin and gave it to a 14-year-old boy who was dying of diabetes. And, uh, and they basically just saved this kid's life. Their boss, or their paper was published in 1922, but their boss in 1923 shared, and his name was McLeod, shared the Nobel Prize with Banting, and McLeod was away during the whole time that the study was done. He was on vacation, his summer vacation, but it was in his lab. So McLeod won the Nobel Prize with Banting, and Best, who was the technician, didn't get anything because technicians didn't win Nobel Prizes in those days. The good news is that uh, McLeod and Banting shared all their money with the folks in the lab who did the work, but the credit um, from the Nobel Committee went to Banting and McLeod, and it was very sad that Best didn't receive the Nobel Prize, which he clearly deserved. Polio. So you've all heard of uh, Salk and Sabin, but the Nobel Prize went to Enders, Weller, and Robbins, who developed the technique for um, culturing the polio virus, which eventually led to the vaccine. And the Salk vaccine was the first, and it 
used an inactivated polio virus that was um, given to subjects. Uh, and there was an, a serious bad incident with the development of this vaccine. There was a lab, ma lab manufacturing error by Cutter when they were inactivating the virus. They extrapolated rather than getting data to the critical dose needed, uh, minimal dose to inactivate the virus, and they actually gave polio, um, I think, to the first thousand or so people who received the vaccine. Uh, but then that was fixed, and then the vaccine was developed. But Sabin's vaccine is probably a better vaccine because it's a live virus vaccine, and you get immunity if you one child in a classroom gets this vaccine, the whole classroom will get it. So it's, it's sort of a perfect vaccine. And Sabin worked with Russian colleagues to prevent this vaccine in the late 1950s. And, uh, and you know that it worked marvelously. I haven't mentioned too, mentioned too much about women because there weren't many women who were doing science in the uh, old days. Uh, but let me mention a few superstars uh, who lived from the 1800s on. Florence Nightingale is the first. She was a great mathematician, and her parents really told her not to go into math because they didn't think it was a ladylike thing to do, and so they told her she had to go into nursing. But she was this mathematician, and she used this t uh, skill um, in the Crimean War, she showed that overcrowded hospitals, um, she worked out the mathematics for how crowding would lead to transmission of infection. And she said you had a good ventilation and spread the beds apart. And doing that, she reduced the intra-hospital infection rate dramatically. Marie Curie is, uh, has an amazing story. Uh, she discovered radium. She realized that radioactivity is an intrinsic atomic property of matter. You may not know, she pioneered a mobile x-ray unit for the French Army in World War I and founded a radiologic school for nurses. With her husband, she was awarded half the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1903 for their study into the spontaneous radiation discovered by uh, Becquerel, who was awarded the other half of the prize. Then she went, won a second Nobel Prize in 1911. Her husband had died uh, for her work in radioactivity. And her daughter, Irene Joliet Curie, was also awarded a Nobel Prize uh, for work with her husband uh, on the discovery of artificial radioactivity. So this is the first example of a parent-child Nobel laureates, whatever that's worth. And then. Rosalind Yallow, who was uh, a medical physicist, collaborated with Solomon Beerson and invented the radioimmune assay. And uh, Beerson died, so he didn't win the Nobel Prize, but uh, Rosalind Yallow did in 1977. She was the first female and first nuclear physicist to win the Lasker Award as well. And Janet Rowley, who died just a few years ago, was an American geneticist in the 1970s. She was the first scientist to identify chromosomal translocation as the cause of leukemia and other uh, cancers. She discovered the Philadelphia chromosome, and she won the National Medal of Science, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and the Lasker Award. So I now want to just say a few comments in the remaining time about um, uh, some statistical approaches, and we'll start with blind studies. You may not realize that the first person to use uh, a blind study was Benjamin Franklin. In 1784, King Louis XVI of France asked Franklin to study um, a problem he had where his people in Paris were hugging the trees in Versailles. And they were convinced it made them better, cured all their ills. And so the king didn't like that. So he asked Franklin to appoint a committee, and he did. And on that committee were all sorts of famous people, such as guillotine of the knife and others. And 
they went to the uh, Versailles and the hugged the trees, this committee, and they couldn't decide whether it made any difference. So they decided to bring in volunteers, blindfold them, and give them objects to hold, some of which were tree limbs and pieces of the uh, Versailles trees. And they concluded that it didn't work. And, uh, but Franklin was phenomenally observant, and he identified the placebo effect. And this was also the discovery of the placebo effect. So the first paper, using blinded approach to do clinical research and identifying a placebo effect was done by Franklin. And the paper, I have a copy of it if anybody's interested, is, is shown here on the right. Probably didn't know that about Franklin. Now, placebo, or blinding, was uh, sort of ignored then, but a few hundred years later, um, Torald Solman, uh, who was a great uh, uh, statistician, suggested a placebo control and blinded observer might be a solution to investigator bias. And that was about 1930. And then, of course, blindfold tests were widely used uh, by advertisers and consumers groups in the 1930s and 1940s. The first use of statistics uh, was a borrowed idea, uh, borrowed from Sir Ronald Almer Fisher, who uh, applied statistics for agriculture use and introduced the application of statistics in experimental design. And for farming and plant fertility, the concept of randomizations and analysis of variance were developed by him, and then it was later applied to medicine. The first modern example of a controlled clinical trial was done by Sir Austin Bradford in 1948, who did a study to show that streptomycin was an effective drug for pulmonary tuberculosis. This was a beautiful study and clearly showed the importance of a randomized control group to prove that streptomycin was an effective therapy for TB. Okay, medical ethics. There's a, you probably heard of Gerhard Hansen who discovered the cause of leprosy in 1874. But this claim was not well received at the time and he became desperate to prove that it really was the cause of leprosy. So without telling some nurses, he inoculated them with live rep leprosy bacillus and he gave them leprosy. And he was sued and he lost. And he was removed from his position, but, but for reasons that aren't completely clear, he was so well recognized in his institution that he was allowed to still work. But he committed what would be considered a grave violation of ethical principles. In 1898, William Osler, at a meeting, uh, said to Giuseppe Santarelli, who had discovered the etiologic agent for yellow fever and did somewhat similar to what Hansen did. He injected this agent into volunteers without telling them and gave them yellow fever. He said to deliberately inject a poison of known high degree of virulency into a human being unless you obtain a man's consent is criminal. And that was the end of Santarelli's career, unlike Hansen. Um, so that was sort of the beginning of informed consent. And um, I'm going to jump ahead to 1953, the day uh, shortly, that within days of the clinical center opening here at NIH, when the medical board, in their very first meeting, under uh, Dr. Luther Terry, who was chair of that board, said that they had to provide each patient with a reasonable understanding of his role in a study project and the means of obtaining evidence for such understanding and consent. And this policy at the clinical center um, had a big effect had a big effect on Congress uh, and the Harris, Kiefer Harris Amendment to the FDA's uh, law stipulated that subjects must be told whether a drug is being used for investigational purposes. And the United States Surgeon General uh, issued an, uh, a policy saying that 
any federal money used uh, to support research uh, using drug development uh, required review by an institutional review board to make sure that it was ethical. And that was on all public health service grants. In 1967, relatively recently, the FDA required all new drug sponsors obtain informed consent for use of investigational drugs in humans. Now you're going to hear about ethics and the history of ethics from Christine Grady and others, and you'll, you'll, you'll learn more about the background and um, current policies. So this is my last slide, and I wanted to leave you with the message, if you haven't figured it out, that the business of clinical research has an, been an international uh, business with great people, literally in every culture, and uh, we're all the beneficiaries of that. And what we do today, I think, is just capitalizing on what an awful lot of people have done before us. So I hope the course that you're going to uh, sit through and uh, uh, in the, throughout the next uh, weeks proves to be uh, interesting to you and helpful. You're going to get learn a lot about statistics and study design. You're going to learn about how to apply for money. You're going to learn how to review. You're going to learn about the ethical, legal, and social issues. And uh, the faculty are phenomenally dedicated and hope that you enjoy the course as much as we enjoy t teaching it. And please fill out your forms uh, as you hear the lectures and help us make the course better uh, each year. So thank you very much. Because if there are any questions here in uh, this room, I'd be happy to entertain them. If not, uh, we're adjourned.